Egg Tech from Ireland, episode 102. Hi, it's Dylan from Tyler's in County Tipperary. We're listening to Paul O'Donnell finish the ICT EDU. Have a listen. So, thanks a million, folks. I'm Paul O'Donnell. I'm principal in Slane National School in Meath. I'm originally from Donegal and I'm currently seconded to my management body. So I think I'm the, perhaps a bit of the wild card in that this isn't really focused on ICT, although I do have some elements of it in it. But I'm just going to talk a wee bit about sustainability in our school and what it means in practice and uh, I suppose what it means to me as well. I'm a pragmatist by nature, so I look at the evidence of knowledge based on the evidence of action and that's I know conceptually sustainability means it, it almost doesn't mean anything anymore I was listening out this week on the radio and I heard sustainability in terms of uh, banking profits sustainability in terms of uh, gas exploration so it's being used by everybody in all sorts of contexts so just to start by way of context and this is background and this is relevant later on. So I was brought up in the 1980s just outside Donegal town. My parents had moved from a very rural area in Donegal to buy half an acre of land just outside the town and they had uh, six of us. It was like, a, like, like small birds do. They had two clutches. There were three of us and then our sister all together. Then they had a wee rest for a few years and then they had two more. And for them, that was a small family. There were 12 in my father's family, there were eight in my mother's. And there were always people around our house. And a lot of our neighbors, the same thing had happened to them. So a lot of families were raised around the same time. And we were outside all the time. They were the two words that were used most commonly in our house, get out. And we didn't need to be told because we loved the outdoors. We were either playing games uh, along the road, we were over farmers' fields. There was probably an area of around two miles radius from our house that was basically our back garden. And with all the people that were coming and going from our house, it was a busy house. The, the three of us slept in a double bed for 12 years together. And we're actually still very close as a result. But at that time, you put three people in a double bed with two pillows and it was fairly intense at times, I'll put it like that. And I'd say, I'd hazard a guess that now, as an adult, there are a few things I've had to cope with uh, since I left that bed that I didn't have to deal with when I was in it. And uh, one time, I was about 11 at the time, I was sick of everyone at home and I said, that's it, I'm out of here, I'm leaving home. It was spring. I got my jacket, I got a loaf of bread, a knife and a pot of jam, I threw it in the bag and I headed over the fields. And I made a den for myself, I was going to move into this place, I was going to use it as a base and I was going to go exploring. I ate half the food, I had a sleep, I did a wee bit of work in the fields, I got some water in a stream and by 7 o'clock that evening I, all the food was gone, I was tired. And there was no helicopter in the sky looking for me. And maybe there was a bit of attention seeking that that's what I wanted. So I said, I better go back home. And I did. And I walked in the back door. I put away the bag, my jacket, the knife. I walked down the hall and my mother came out of the bathroom and said, where have you been? Get into that bath. Your two brothers are finished. The water will be cold. Hurry up. And that was the end of it. And I just was heading in and she said, and do you know where the bread is? And she found the answer to that question about five years ago. So that's an example of what life was like. We, we, there was no formal parenting as such. And we loved it. So in the mornings we would feed cattle and sheep for a local farmer. And then we'd go to school, we'd come home, we'd do our homework, we'd be out again until it got dark. And it suited everybody. And I would honestly say now, I was addicted to the outdoors. I didn't know the names of plants or flowers. But I knew the rhythm of the seasons. I knew autumn by blackberries appearing. Then it was conkers for school. And then it was uh, picking spuds for Paddy Brogan, a local farmer. And 
Then, I suppose there's a, uh, the Greek poet Kafafi says, the streets and fields where you grew up, there you will live and there you will die. And I think everybody has a memory of themselves at 10 or 11 years of age and the life that they had then that's still a big part of themselves. And I was feel fortunate now that that's the life that I had. So I'm going to go completely away from that and I'm going to come back to it. Because I have a question for you now. I'm just going to put it up on the meter. And my question for you is, I would like you to name a global issue or a couple relating to sustainability. There's three main areas. So I think it's, the code is up there. Um, three main areas. So we have, I suppose, the natural world. Then we also have social issues arising from that. And we have economic issues that are, that are now really important, big questions for us on the planet. So if you can, can you get in and can you do it? Yeah. Good. Because, as I say, technology is not my strong point. I'm very fortunate to have the two lads here beforehand. They had to convince me to put the mic on. <laughs> but they got it on. Um, so if you can, and you can type it in and send it. Is it send it? Yes, brilliant. So it is working. Okay, so 30 seconds, whatever you can think of in terms of degradation of the natural world or social issues, and we have a lot of them in Ireland, we don't have to go abroad, and economic issues as well. So I'm just going to read them as you shout there. Climate change, monoculture, poverty, bees, equity, transition, responsibility, ice packs, um, climate justice, education, responsibility, and we'll just go for three or four more seconds. So, even the, what you have put up there, they're really big global issues. Um, massive issues to, to talk about for us even now. So, my question is, how the hell do you teach that to a five-year-old? Or a ten-year-old? Or even a twenty-year-old? How do you discuss these issues? And at a level that people can understand it, and at a, people, a level they can engage with it, and at a level that they can then respond to it. And with more consumption. Brilliant. Transition. So, that's an interpretation of what education for sustainable development is. So, these kind of the understanding, the knowledge, the value, values, and the skills. And for me, I felt I, I had a connection with those, with those, because I felt like I was a part of the outdoor world around me. But the difficulty for me was that when I then started teaching, I realized there was no support there for me to, to work with children on this. So we look back even the last 10, like the, the primary school curriculum, really good, allotted internationally, breadth and scope, but very little in, way, in the way of proper implementation due to a lack of in-service, finance, all the usual stuff. Ashtar 2009, very few references to the outdoor environment. The numeracy and literacy strategy, priority in numeracy and literacy, and delay geography and history in the curriculum. And then the Peace to Resistance in 2015, the education plan, 70 pages, 320 actions, not a single reference to sustainability or not a single reference to the natural world. So that's where we're, that's the backdrop. And as, as the old quote goes, with a pair of tourists looking for directions, I wouldn't be starting from here. But I suppose recent events are catapulting things, and quite often, whether we want them or not, that's what begins to lead the change. Um, but a, a study by Paddy Madden in 2019 found that 70%, 75% of teachers were teaching about the natural outdoor world using digital technology. So, this is what I came back to before I started teaching. Um, David Sobel, what is important is that children have the chance to bond with the world, to love it, before being asked to heal its wounds. 
And that's what I wanted for the children I was teaching, that they had the chance that I had to build that relationship. Because for whatever I uh, gave to the natural world, I certainly got back tenfold. So I started to do that with no preparation, no planning, in a big urban school in me, with children who had lived a completely different life to me. I had children who were getting up in the morning, going directly from, to the creche, from the creche to school, from school to the creche, from creche to home, and rinse and repeat for five days a week. They were never outside. They had no concept of what the outdoors was. And I would say that's actually more closer to the norm now. That was 20 years ago. So I just went for it. So I had the children outside every day. And then all the problems started to happen. A parent complained that their child didn't have gloves when they were picking up wood lice. Then I had more common problems, children coming home dirty every day. So I said, okay, I'm going to have to roll back on that. So I'm going to connect with their, something that's important to them, their, their pets. And I had a pet day in the school, uh, in my class. But I, I forgot to tell my principal. And he heard this commotion when he was walking past and walked in the room. And my abiding memory is him looking down at three dogs going after two cats, a parent with a ferret on the other side of the room, and me holding a hamster at the top of the class. And just as he was about to say something, everyone heard this noise and turned towards the door to hear a horse box reversing into the schoolyard. <laughs> so obviously that wasn't repeated again either. Uh, that, that was the end of that. So I had to think more practically. And this is what I came up with then. I was going to teach one lesson a week outdoors. So outdoor learning goes from very simply teaching the lessons you were going to teach anyway, but doing it outside, all the way then to using the outdoor environment as a part of what you're teaching. And I started simply, I was doing one lesson, English, maths, whatever, we just had some tables outside, I took them outside and we did it. And we went out every week. And then I started to use the outdoors as we worked. And as I used it, the children started to pick up more incidental things week on week. We started to monitor the seasons, we checked the temperature, we looked at the weather, we just watched things rolling by, as well as a short lesson. And I could not believe at the end of the year how much they had picked up. And over the years I started to collect more and more of these lessons and change it around. And other teachers started asking me for ideas and started to do a bit too. And then over the course of 10 or 15 years, I had accumulated all these lessons. And uh, Meath County Council said, would you be interested in putting a book together? So I did. I wrote a book. And it had 36 lessons, one for every week of the year, that could be done at most class levels. And I would lay everything on for the teacher. The background was there how to do it step by step, how the resources, ICT links embedded in them as well for maybe introduction videos and um, so people could use them. And I did it on one condition. I said, I don't want any money for it. What I want instead is that every primary school teacher in Meath would get a free copy. And they said, okay. So that's why I'm happy to talk about it. I'm not plugging anything. And so 1,500 copies they give to every teacher in Meath. And they had another thousand copies left over. And they said, well, what do we do with these? I said, sell them at cost price. If people want one, they'll get it. There's not a profit-making exercise. So they said, okay, so 10 euro postage and packaging. And those thousand books are all gone too. So there is an interest. There is a desire there for people, for teachers, to use natural things outdoors. And I'm going to show you one very quick lesson. Because is Molly here? And Dylan? Dylan, come with me. Because I had a task for Dylan earlier. And Killian. Is Killian here? He's gone. It's okay. Come with me, Dylan. Can you take over the nest there, please? So, one of the lessons, and I always, on a Monday, I put up, this is what we need for our lesson on the Friday. Now, I'm an admin principal now. I still teach fifth class all year. I take them once a week, and I do their lesson outdoors between the breaks on a Friday. And it's generally SESE, but we use a other stuff as well. So this is a simple lesson. Oh yeah, sorry. This. So, can you come over here with me? And it's a nest building challenge. Very simple. 
This is the time of year where birds are starting to build nests. So I rake some moss off my lawn, bit of grass, throw it in the bag, and I throw it out along, put the pupils in groups of three, and they have to build a nest for a small bird. That's their task. So this is a cracker. It's a great job. So can you hold up your arm for me? And hold your fingers like this as if they're on a tree. And I'm going to put your nest sitting on it because I'm going to test it. So it was funny. When I said to Killian earlier, Killian, I have a job for you. I want you to try and make a nest with all this stuff. He said, yes. <laughs> uh, so I have a golf ball. I'm going to pop it in. And level one is a, ve is a very quiet, mild day. Level five is hurricane off the coast of North Donegal. So we're going level one. Well done. Level two, a bit breezier. Uh-oh, I lost a bit of... Got her in off the side there. Level three, it's getting windy. Are you holding on to that golf ball? Well done. Level four. Oh my God. Hey, hey. Oh, give him a round of applause. Well done. Woo. You can leave that over there. Too, man. So, just really simple stuff. Then we cut pieces of wool and we put them out on the fence at the back of the school for the birds to take to build their nests. And generally then the kids go home and I take it off the fence and then they come in, oh it's gone. So it's just simple stuff you can do. You don't need anything fancy in your school to do these lessons. And so I continue doing that um, and then, then I hit the jackpot because I became principal in St. Patrick's National School in Slane. And there were two things that attracted me to the, to the position. One was they had five green flags outside the school. And number two, they had uh, land at the back of the school. Space, green space. So when I, um, when I went there, I was very lucky. Because they already had sustainable practices in place. And there, that ethos was already there. But the teacher who was driving it had left the school. And... When I went in, I watched for the first year, and a lot of the stuff, I would, you know, I'd do a lot of chat to the pupils, and what's this mean, and what's that mean, and people didn't really know anymore what they were doing in the school. And then I had a chat with the staff and said, we have to do one of two things here. We're either taking these flags down, or we have to do, we have to do implement this. Because we're, we're kind of lying by saying, oh, look at our great flags, and then not knowing what they're about. So... We then started to look at practices in the school under those flags. But my big thing was, this has to be led by the pupils. Because there's no point in us having these fancy projects and them not understanding it. So they have to lead it, and they have to understand what they're doing. And they also have to see the significance of this for the wider world. So, already in their history plans, the pupils in each of the classes from first to sixth went to a local place as part of their history. So we're lucky in Slane, that's Newgrange. We also have Slane Castle, we have the Hill of Slane, we have the Battle of the Boyne site. But again, lots of schools have like these around them and the children haven't a clue what they are or their historical significance. And I thought the big thing here was let's get them having a sense of identity about where they're from. So it's not just about being outside, it becomes a part of them in their school. So the first thing I did was I got the four picnic tables, ripped down a blackboard, stuck it on the wall, and that became our outdoor classroom. Very simple space. And I started doing Crow Park hours with the teachers out on it. So they were learning in it before they then started to bring the pupils out. And some embraced it completely. Some rarely went out. I wasn't pushing anybody. But of course, come a day like today, it was chock-a-block and everyone was given out that there was no room for them. And then, practically with recycling, we put containers inside the gate of the school for projects. So we gathered two litre bottles and made a greenhouse in the school. We had our rainwater harvesting for raised beds. We, uh, an artist was doing a project. He was making a whale skeleton or frame from footballs, old footballs. So again, these were practical projects that the children brought stuff in and then they saw something happening as a result, and there were discussions about it as well. So when I came, there were five waste 
five recycling, oh, two recycling bins and five waste bins going out each week. So we got green bins from Meath County Council. We got the children to bring in more sustainable packaging in their lunch boxes. And every Friday, the green bins go out here. So this is a very fancy name, New Zealand box method. It's four pallets nailed together, and the compost goes inside it. So the green bins go in there, but the pupils are in charge of this in the classes. There's somebody in the class that lets everyone know what's allowed in it and what's not. And all the brown waste, apples, banana skins, all of that stuff goes in here on a Friday. And then we need, oh, that's green waste, then the brown waste, shreddings from cardboard and paper in the school. And that's mixed up and it goes on to the raised beds in spring. So we now have one waste bin going out every two weeks and five recycling bins going out. So again, it's practical and the children are leading it. There's one child who stands there, he's a monitor, you can come in, no, you get out, no. And then every class has somebody who's in charge of what's going into the bin. And there's not, no hell, hell is no, what is the phrase? Hell hath no fury like a junior infant monitor when somebody else put something into that bin that wasn't supposed to be in. Then, after about five years, we got some hens. And the pupils formed a company and they called it the Goggly Gog Egg Company because it was a song, an Irish song, Goggly Gog McCurkey. And so they had to make a business plan. So they got a loan for uh, a hen house and a fenced area around it and all the gear came to about 600 euro. I built, I, they paid for the materials but I built the hen house. And they got, of course, one of them got their grandfather then to fence it. They were trying to cut down on costs. They did a deal with the local farm supplier for a preferential rate for hen feed. They pitched to the PA who gave them a loan for the costs. A four-year loan with interest, which they pay back within two years. So they sell the eggs to pupils in the school on a rota, class by class. And they, there's somebody on accounts. They're on maintenance every day, they have to clean it out, they have to look after them. We got the county vet out to inspect it. And my finest piece of academic work, I created a policy keeping poultry in school. <laughs> and because I knew there would be some parents who did not want their children involved in this, but I wanted them to get that experience. And I did have some parents who said, my child is not participating in this bird flu and avian, all this stuff. I said, that's fine, that's no problem. Two weeks later, they were back. I'm not happy about this, but my child wants to do it. So can they? Of course they can. There's no problem. And one parent said to me, I don't know what's going on up at that school, because I can't. My daughter will do nothing for me in the house. And then I hear she's cleaning hen shit up the school outside. So again, when they're leading it themselves, when you're letting them, uh, and, and they do all the talking at assemblies in our school, we, we lay it on for them, but... The classes present, and we have this going all the time talking about this, so all the rest of the pupils in the school are hearing about it. We had a massacre with a mink, and they all gone. And we had one sick hen that I had to take to the vet for five days in a row after school, and eventually it died, and one of the pupils said, well, that's nature, Mr. O'Donnell. <laughs> so, again, it was, it's just, it's, it's great learning for them. We also looked at increasing biodiversity in the school grounds. Now this isn't like, uh, you know, a massive study. We just started putting in small wildflower meadows. We planted some trees. We put up some nest boxes. Uh, we did it bit by bit. And we have swallows coming every year. We have frogs. We put a wee pond in. We have frogs coming back. You can see that's a house sparrow chick um, in the far corner being fed just before it takes off. That's the wildflower meadow at the front of the school. We had a hedgehog that wandered over. We had a range of biodiversity that came to the school that was never seen before. Our deputy, who's retired, fantastic lady, said that she had never seen goldfinches in the school, and she was there for 40 years. And we had them then when we had our wildflowers in. So, again, this was all just within our own boundary in the school. We did integrate ICT, and not a complete Luddite. So we had a weather station in the garden. My son is doing engineering, he's an engineer now, and he had a raspberry pie, and I said, okay, well, let's see how good you are now. There's that weather station, there's a raspberry pie. Can you get it to send the signal 
for our weather twice a day to our Twitter account. And he said, okay, leave it with me. And he did. And just before small break and just before big break, the weather comes out, comes up on the Twitter account. And then again, we linked it to the pupils' lives. So grass grows at six degrees. You're not going to find it on our Twitter account at the minute because I'm gone a couple of years. I'm seconded and something, a couple of things seem to go haywire, so it's not on it now. So it's a job for me when I go back next year. But grass grows at six degrees. So we said, if it's six degrees or higher, the pupils can choose to wear jackets or not when they go out for a break. But if it's below six degrees, they have to put their coats on. So a child goes up and reads out the weather twice a day, and you can hear, yes, coming from the classrooms if it's above six degrees. Because they don't want to wear them a lot of the time. But at least it gave us a rationale that when they could choose and when they couldn't. So that's just a bit of the garden. Like it's not something out of Kew Gardens. It's quite small. We have raised beds. We have the hens. We have a pond at the front. The greenhouse. We have an area at the back. But it's part of the yard. The children can come and go in and out of it. It's not this kind of, oh no, no, you can't be good in there. There's none of that. And again, some people say, oh, maybe this might, maybe that. I say, okay, I'll bring the insurance company. If we have a garden, can they go into it? Is there going to be supervision? Yeah, the teacher's on the yard. Okay, no problem. The insurance company has never said, no, can we put a pond in? No problem. Are you going to have a safety feature? Yes, no problem. But you get a lot of this, oh, no, health and safety. Oh, my God, we can't be doing that. Oh, jeez, no. It's the best excuse ever. And the most sensible people in the school to talk about health and safety are actually the pupils. You stand before, okay, what do we need to be worried about? They'll tell you everything. And we have them coming in for that lesson. In the winter, they wear boots. So they have a change of footwear. They go out with jackets. I say, listen, we're going out, that's it. And now, as I say, I'm gone a couple of years, but now there's Aster outdoors happening at infants. They're all bringing in full gear. And they're doing it every day. So it's growing in that way. I think Greta Thunberg has really set in motion a massive wave from the younger generation in relation to climate change, in relation to well, how we use the planet that we're living on. And it has had very positive, I suppose, repercussions. And we now have climate action and sustainability is going to be a leave and search subject. And there is going to be a sustainability plan in education policy. And in addition to that, we also have much more awareness, primary, second, third level. And the likes of Antashka who have stepped in, in this case, and provided a framework, there will be a framework in terms of sustainability in the new primary curriculum. So there is a lot to be hopeful for, whether by accident or design. And I think the important thing now is we do have to acknowledge there is a problem. And everyone can do something. And that's maybe home, that's maybe work, and also in terms of a policy push. Because this idea of you just doing your own bit at home is not going to be enough. But if we do, um, and we have all of that together, then there is still hope. And the old expression, the best time to plant trees is 20 years ago. But the next best time is now. Thank you very much, folks. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Egg Tip from Ireland. You can hear more of our podcast by following ICTEDU on your audio player. Thank you for listening to Egg Tip from Ireland. Bye for now.